My name is Diana Wells. I'm President Emerita of Ashoka, um, working on things uh, impact and learning at Ashoka today. I'm joined by Akhtar Bacha, who I have had the pleasure of knowing for a couple of decades now. Uh, he has just finished his, a book called The Purpose Mindset. Uh, Akhtar has had a long career at, at Microsoft, um, having uh, led what is now called Microsoft Philanthropies for over a decade. Um, teaches at University of Washington in the policy and governance uh, school as well as the business school. Um, is on multiple boards and has a wonderful title called Chief Catalyst for the Catalytic Innovators Group, uh, which he has started. Welcome, Akhtar. For those of you uh, who have just joined, any, um, if you would put in the chat where you're calling in from, uh, that would be great. I am calling from Washington, D.C. today, and in the tradition of Ashoka U, uh, will also say I'm located on the traditional territory of the Algonquin, the Nakachetank Nation, which has become part of the Piscatomani Nation, a place which has long served as a site of meeting and exchange among nations. From wherever you're joining us today, we invite you to reflect on the land upon which you stand and the indigenous people we know who know it as home. So Akhtar, uh, thank you for joining us today. Uh, we, we had the chance to meet two decades ago when you were at leading uh, what is now called Microsoft Philanthropies and you and Will Poole came to visit us at Ashoka, but I know your connection to Ashoka goes back even further. Uh, as we, before we jump into your book, just if you would tell us a little bit about that story. Yeah, so uh, first of all, Diana, thank you so much for inviting me to be part of this effort. I have been a great, great, great fan of Bill and Ashoka, I have, I got introduced to Ashoka when I was an architecture student in India in the mid seventies when Kirti Shah was on the board of Ashoka at that point and he actually talked to us about this Ashoka fellows and how we can become part of this incredible group of people that are change makers. And when I joined MIT as a student and then as a faculty, I had several Ashoka fellows who were students of mine. So I had this long relationship with the change makers network and the Ashoka fellows. So I'm really thrilled to be part of this conversation. Well, thank you. And it's been great for us to be in touch with you over this journey. Um, what drove you to write this book? And what now? Why now? Why now? So actually, the book has been in my head for many years. But I think the, the reason why I, I wanted to write the book is to get people to realize that there is a whole different world of individuals that want to serve. They are not looking at who they want to be. They are more interested in who they want to serve. And in the business environment, we are primarily focused on growth and the growth mindset, which is actually important and critical. But there is this whole community of people that have a different mindset, a mindset of being change makers. Mm -hmm. And purpose to me describes that and embodies the value of change makers. And that's why I decided to write the book and titled it Purpose Mindset so that we can think about not just the focus on the me, 
but also on the we and the collective. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. And talk to me a little bit more about purpose and and why why the title, uh, how it differs from uh, the the growth mindset um, and Robert Reich's ideas, also. So so purpose to me is that renewable source of energy that continues to power us to better humanity. Mm. And the book, I highlight five principles. One, working from your strengths and discovering your strengths. Second, putting on the lens of abundance and not scarcity. Every change maker puts on a lens of abundance. Third, the focus is not on being efficient. The focus on, is on being effective and being impactful. Fourth, it's not about an organization. It's about taking moments and turning it into movements. Mm -hmm. And fifth, it is about moving on that path from being generous, generosity, to being empathetic and compassionate. And it is that journey that allows us to discover other elements of who we are and the service that we want to be in. And that to me is what is purpose. Without purpose, we actually lose our path. And do you see, uh, to what extent do you see management practices at Microsoft? You talk about how Microsoft early on uh, made, made some decisions to uh, focus on people's ability to, employees' ability to, to drive purpose and to own purpose. How did they go about doing that? Or, or when, where do you think that, yeah, how did that I, happen? I think what is fascinating is what is the role of a workplace? Mm -hmm. And Mary Gates, and Bill Newcomb, who came in as the chief legal officer, both recognize the importance of the workplace. That the workplace is not just where you come and work. We spend most of our time in the workplace. But the workplace is also where you discover and engage with the community. Mary Gates encouraged Bill Gates to start an employee payroll deduction program in support of United Way in 1983. Bill Newcomb, when he came in as the chief legal officer in 1985, he basically understood that these young tech individuals working very hard to change the world through technology will eventually establish roots in the community, get married here, have kids here, and there has to be a way by which they get exposed into the community. And Community Affairs, which is the predecessor of the philanthropy group, got created with the ability that encouraging employees to give back their time and their money into the community with the company matching it. Mm -hmm. And that recognition that the importance of a workplace as a space where people from different disciplines, different ideas could all come together, not just around a product or a value that the company has, 
but also bring that same energy to better the community. Getting, coming back to your principles, um, they resonate with, uh, of course, the Ashoka's idea of change makers and social entrepreneurs that, you know, I, I can go through a long list of social entrepreneurs where the starting from a place of abundance, seeing assets where others see deficits um, is something that resonates uh, with you and uh, with your, your thinking here. Um, and extending the, the common good as we think about change makers who are working not not for the me, but for the we, as you put it I, very effectively. One uh, thing you write about uh, also is, is taking David Brooks' idea of the second mountain. Um, and climbing that second mountain is the title of one of your chapters. And uh, as someone has built their career uh, and been moving toward thinking about the we and, and contributing. Do you see and have you seen that more young people are starting there or, or that uh, this, as in the next, in recent generations that, uh, you know, you reference Malala and you reference um, other young activists how do we think about, and now that you are teaching also at the university, how do we move toward uh, ensuring or, or uh, meeting the demand that the younger generation is, is thinking about purpose perhaps earlier? So the way I kind of think about it is, if you take any group, take my students, I can divide them into three. One third are totally focused on purpose. The other third are focused on money. And the other third are focused on title. And I don't mean them in any derogatory way at all. There is no value judgment. Mm -hmm. Like some are in a position where they will only do something which meets their purpose. Others are coming into a work environment with the intention that they need to get financially stable. And others are coming in because they might have come from environments where they might not have been given the self-respect and see the workplace as a way to build that first. What I'm hoping happens is whether it's in the education space, which is where we are talking to teachers and educators and students, act for every of us, even if purpose is not a first driver, it can be a secondary driver. Mm -hmm. And what Microsoft did through its employee engagement program, it gave the opportunity for all employees to at least get exposed to the idea of purpose. And some of them activated it as part of climbing the second mountain. Mm -hmm. Others did it right from the beginning and it was just part of how they were. Some switched careers and came at it very late in life. So, so to me, this is about a journey. And the education part for me, for students is, again, focus on your strengths, put on the lens of abundance. You can find resources, even small resources can turn into big mm -hmm. issues, if only you apply. And in my book, I tell stories of how some of them have been able to do that. Don't focus on doing things right. Focus on doing the right thing. I, I mean, that's the important part. 
And like Ashoka, and like Bill Drayton, it is taking a moment and turning it into a movement. And the only way you can turn things into a movement, if you invite people in to join with you, it is not about your ideas and your journey. It is about the people you want to serve and their desires and how you activate their desires and you service them. And that, that turns into a movement. And then how do we get to that point of being compassionate where we are willing to sacrifice our life for somebody else? Now, all of us are not gonna do that and should not do it. But that ability to recognize every single human being has a purpose in life and they play a role, whether you are poor or whether you're wealthy. Yes, and that's a, a complete fit with the everyone a change maker vision, right? Yeah, um, absolutely. <laughs> and especially now in this time of ever uh, more growing pace of change. Uh, so being able to drive change uh, from a sense of purpose rather than be rolled over by, by it. Um, in, in the, um, I, I'd love to tease out some, ex this, the idea of engagement and how uh, Microsoft developed opportunities for uh, team members to engage with the local community. Can you offer a couple of examples of that? Yeah, so, <clears throat> so clearly when, you know, you're young, you come in to an exciting company that is about to change the world, you're working 18 hours a day. And when the program was set up where the company would match dollar for dollar to any donation you made, most people early on just donated to the alma mater. Universities are great at getting money out of people. Right? And it's a very easy thing. Oh, I got an email. Oh, well, maybe at that time it was a letter. Here is a check. In company will match it. I gave 500. Company gave 500. It's $1,000. And it's gone to my alma mater. And I'm good. But slowly, by creating engagement opportunities where the community was invited into the company, because employees were spending 18 hours a day on campus at Microsoft. So bringing them in, exposing them, eventually as these people grew up, they started having other engagements. They had kids, they started participating in their kids' soccer tournaments, became coaches, started becoming part of PTAs. You know, people fell sick suddenly that became an important issue. People started hiking in this environment and suddenly became, you know, got aware of conservation and land as issues. So this grew by just exposing people. And what is important in a company and a workplace is this constant exposure and new efforts that have to be developed. So if you look at every decade in Microsoft, New programs were in introduced, new elements were put in place to keep that curve going up. Otherwise, it's going to stagnate. And today, they've introduced micro volunteering where you can actually volunteer for 15 minutes. Mm -hmm. You can do an online thing, volunteer for 15 minutes, get that time matched with dollars. And so people are now able to do something even on their lunch break. Earlier we had it that you had to volunteer for 10 hours before you got matched. Mm -hmm. And now we are not in that environment where anybody can go outside. So these shifts are what encourage people. And also now there is technology. So all of that to me is important to put in place is to understand the environment you are in and the context you are in to create these efforts. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. I have one or two more questions, but if, 
if any members of the audience want to drop questions into the chat, please do. Um, I, I think it would be wonderful for the audience to hear examples from your book about how, how the focus on abundance and, and where to start, uh, even if resources are very small. Any thoughts or examples? Uh, yeah, Jerry? so I'll, give, I'll just give an example of Kevin Wang, who is an employee, was an employee at Microsoft was, and started a program called Teals, which is to bring computer science education into high schools. Mm -hmm. Most school, high schools in this country, 65,000 of them, less than 2,000 of them have a formal computer science class. And there is a shortage of people who are actually graduating as computer science majors. So he basically said, hey, I can go volunteer an hour in the class, work with the teacher and teach basic computer science, not how to use a computer, but computer science, coding. And he started doing that. And he came to us and said, hey, I want to get other employees to volunteer with me. Could you help me? Mm -hmm. We kind of gave him a little bit of money. We were looking at it and saying, what is this computer science? We are trying to solve basic digital literacy. Forget about computer science. But he kept at it. He went from one school to three schools to eight schools. Now they are in 600 schools in this country. There are 6,000 people that volunteer for a year to teach a class. And these are employees from Microsoft, from Amazon, from Facebook, from Google, from the defense industry. Mm -hmm. They are in remote schools. They are now, obviously everything is online, but we were teaching online remote years ago, but he never gave up. And that initial effort now, 10 years later, it is an established program at Microsoft that is supporting hundreds of schools as a collective vision of the tech community. So it's just one way to think about it. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Thank you. I want to open up. We have about five minutes mm -hmm. left. Anybody in the audience would like to uh, ask a question, feel free to come off camera. And while you're thinking of it, I just want to kind of give one other message of why I wrote this book. Yes. And why now? We are living in this extraordinary time where we are being put into our separate corners. And what is important is the ability to create bridging networks where people from different walks of life can actually come together around a common issue. And employee engagement and purpose is that neutral space that allows you to do that. And it was that exploration that was also important. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Any questions? Well, then I will keep going. Um, <laughs> your, your work uh, at Catalytic Innovators, um, how are you employing, uh, or in your work at Catalytic Innovators, are you doing work to uh, advising people on, de on developing a purpose? <clears throat> Yes, I am as much as I can between a full-time day job of teaching. Mm -hmm. But I just give you a small example, which has turned into a major effort. In May, a bunch of us just friends and colleagues, ex Microsoft guys came together and said, here's the pandemic. What can we do through technology to help the state of Washington open up the economy? Mm -hmm. And we started an organization to do that with the idea of doing, understanding the needs of the community of personal protection equipment, running campaigns to change behavior so people can actually start wearing masks. Now we are working on creating a dashboard for small businesses so that they can effectively open up 
This just started as a volunteer effort for a bunch of people who felt that they needed to do something. Mm -hmm. That was because we were driven by purpose. And today we are actually working under a CARES grant to do this work nationally. And now we are partnering with the Gates Foundation to take this work outside of the country. And we are basically a bunch of idiots, seriously, that just came together. So this notion of ensuring that you can contribute at any scale is important. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Great. Any other questions? So let me draw you out on empathy and compassion. Uh, how, how do we, you know, in the academy, um, in our workplace, drive empathy and compassion? I, I mean, I mean, at least in the workplace, it is a very compa competitive environment, right? But I think it is the recognition that every voice counts. Mm -hmm. Now we call it DEI, but essentially change makers and Ashoka's principle has been every voice counts. Mm -hmm. And if you can take that principle of every voice counts, then you start creating an environment in which you are introducing empathy. Mm -hmm. And then as that deepens, you start becoming compassionate. Mm -hmm. And the focus starts moving from the me and my growth and my self-satisfaction to who am I serving mm -hmm. and the impact that is being made. And I think that's the journey that educators can instill among students mm -hmm. and students are already very much in the space. They just need to be ignited, mm -hmm. right? And we need catalysts to actually ignite their energy and then you send them off and they're off and running. Mm -hmm. So classrooms become very important as a place by which you introduce these senses and purpose to me is that driver. Mm -hmm. Yes, your comment about, um, I, you know, at Ashoka, we have talked about self-permission is sometimes the biggest barrier to people beginning these journeys. Um, it is not the only barrier, but it is one. <laughs> so uh, we are at 1230. Thank you all for joining. Uh, and thank you, Akhtar, for being with us uh, on this long journey and for your latest contribution to the movement. Very much appreciate it. Thank you very much. And I see you later on in the afternoon. Okay, wonderful. Take, Take care. care. Bye. Take Thank you.